Section 18, Part 2 of Astounding Stories 8, August 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty in Winston, Salem, North Carolina. Astounding Stories 8, August 1930 by Arthur J. Burks. The Flying City, Part 2. Meanwhile, in that great Brooklyn laboratory, Kendrick was working against time, besieged by frantic delegations of the nation's leaders. They knew now that their one hope lay in him. Was he succeeding? Was there even any hope? Face haggard, eyes bloodshot from lack of sleep, he waved them away, went on with his work. I will tell you as soon as I know. That was all he would say. Followed a night that was the blackest in all history though the myriad stars of heaven shone tauntingly brilliant in the summer sky. At length, as dawn was breaking, Kendrick paused in his labors. There, he said grimly, surveying an apparatus that seemed to involve the entire facilities of the laboratory. It is done. Now then, will it work? The delegation were called to witness the test. Henderson Blake was among them, as was Marjorie. She stepped forward as he prepared to make the demonstration. I know, somehow, you're going to be successful, she murmured, pressing his hand, meeting his eyes with a smile of confidence. I hope you're right, Marjorie, he replied, letting slip the last word almost unconsciously. Her face colored warmly as they stepped back and rejoined her father. Kendrick's heart was beating fast as he turned to his instruments. How could he fail, with faith like that behind him? love even perhaps he mustn't fail nor would he if his theories were sound addressing the assemblage he explained briefly the complicated apparatus these towers he said pointing to four steel structures about ten feet high arranged at the corners of a square roughly twenty feet across are miniature radio masts the area enclosed by them we will assume is the city of new york that metal disk suspended above the area represents the invader. It contains a miniature heat generator such as I was experimenting with recently in the Arizona desert. He paused, threw a switch. Somewhere in the laboratory, a dynamo began to whir. I am now sending electromagnetic waves from the four towers, he resumed, but instead of broadcasting them in every direction, I am bending them in concave cathode of force over the city. You may picture this cathode as an invisible shield if you choose, but it is more than that. It is a reflector. If my theories are right, the radio energetic ray I am about to project upon it from my miniature disk will be flung back to its source as though it had been a ray of light falling on a mirror. The success of the experiment depends upon what the result will be. Kendrick ceased, moved toward a rheostat, as he made ready to touch it. A breathless tension settled upon the assemblage. Upon the outcome of what was now to happen rested the fate of America and the world. Calmly, though every fiber in his being was at breaking stress, the young scientist opened the rheostat. For an instant, the ray seared down. Then, as it boomeranged back, the disk burst into flame, dissolved, disintegrated. A thin dust like carbon slowly settled to the laboratory floor. Cutting off the current from the radio towers, Kendrick faced them, a light of triumph in his tired eyes. You see, it works, he said. They saw. Beyond a doubt, it worked. And what Kendrick saw, as his eyes met Marjorie's, made him forget his fatigue. The rest was a mad scramble of preparation. Only a few brief hours remained and much was to be done. The application of the principle that had just been demonstrated involved a hookup from the Consolidated Electric Laboratory with every broadcasting station in the metropolitan area, power being supplied by commandeering every generating plant within a radius of fifty miles. The city, moreover, had to be evacuated of all but the few brave hundreds who volunteered to stand by their posts at radio stations and generating plants. As for Kendrick, it was the busiest, most hectic morning he had ever experienced. Only the realization of a girl's love 
and a nation's trust enabled him to overcome the exhaustion of two sleepless nights. At length, a little before eleven, all was in readiness. Just two questions troubled the young scientist's mind. Had the people of the disk learned of their preparation to counter the attack? And would the improvised broadcasting apparatus of the area stand the stupendous strain that would be placed upon it if the ray came down? The first of these questions was answered staggeringly at a quarter after eleven. Kendrick, oh my God, cried Blake, bursting into the laboratory. Marjorie, they've got her again. Look, read this. He thrust out a piece of paper. Kendrick took it, read, Your daughter will be my queen after this noon. Where'd you get it? He gasped. One of the invisible devils thrust it into my hand right out in the street, not five minutes ago, Blake explained, trembling with anguish. Do you realize what this means, Kendrick? She's on the disk now, and in a scant three quarters of an hour. Yes, I realize, his voice came grimly, and I realize, too, that they don't know their fate. They'll stay. There's forty-five minutes yet. We can't abandon our defense against the ray, not even for Marjorie. But I'll go. I'll rescue her or die with her. And even as Blake mutely reached out his hand to grip that of the determined young man who stood before him, Kendrick touched his wrist mechanism and went invisible. Once on the street, he pressed the escalator button as well, and by the strength of the vibrations that followed, he knew he must be very close within that mysterious lifting zone. Running west the block, he found it growing stronger. Fairly racing now, he continued on toward the river, progress unhampered in the deserted streets. Suddenly, with a thrill of exultation, he felt himself swept up, whirled away toward that great shimmering hulk against the sun. What hope? He was thinking. What possible hope? And the answer came. Kor. Reaching the disk, he switched out the escalator influence and hastened across the city to that monumental structure of jade green stone. The mighty little dwarf would be up there in his glittering mosaic apartment, or in his pinnacle laboratory, perhaps ready to pull the lever that would release that stupendous blast of heat. Gaining the jeweled door of the monarch's quarters at last, after escaping detection by a hair's breadth more than once, he pressed the button outside, just as the guard had done that first time. In response, the door opened, and there stood Kor. He stood there an instant, that is, while the expression on his leathery face went from inquiry to alarm. Then, as Kendrick burst into the room and shut the door, he went invisible. In that same instant, the young scientist's eyes beheld a sight that caused his heart to leap. There sat Marjorie, bound in a chair, an expression half of hope, half of dejection on her face. "'It's I, Gordon,' he called. "'Take courage!' "'Oh, I prayed you'd come, and you came,' she murmured as her face lightened. Then tensely she added, "'The door! Look out!' Kendrick wheeled, and just in time, the door was opening. Not so fast, he called, lunging. His hands gripped the dwarf, yanked him back, throttled him before he could emit a cry, pushed the door shut. Kor struggled like a madman, but it was futile. Kendrick's hands cut into his throat like a vice. After a moment or two, he gasped, relaxed. Releasing his grip then, Kendrick felt for his wrist, stripped off his bracelet, whereupon the dwarf became visible. His face was putty white. He was either dead or unconscious. Restoring his own visibility then, he advanced to Marjorie, swiftly freed her. Take this, he said, handing her Cora's bracelet. She slipped it on. Now let's tie him and get out of here. He may be dead, but we can't take any chances. The dwarf wasn't dead, however, for he groaned and opened his eyes as they lifted him into the chair. You win, Professor but it avails you nothing he smiled maliciously my capture my death even will not prevent the ray the orders have been given it will be projected sharp at twelve you but go to your doom that said kendrick is a matter of opinion swiftly they bound him gagged him and now he added we wish you good day and such fate as you deserve then turning to Marjorie, your hand again, 
There was a new tenderness in its soft warmth that thrilled him. They touched their buttons, went invisible. Silently, then, they stole from the apartment. Swiftly they made their way down to the concourse, raced across the city to the amber court, descended to the trap door. It must be nearly twelve, Kendrick knew. He couldn't look at his watch, for it as well as himself was invisible. Indeed, even as they stood there, poised for the plunge, a faint whistle rose from below. Marjorie trembled. Steady, he spoke. Some of them always blow a minute or two before. Are you ready? Yes. Then press your button. Jump! Even as they leapt, the sickening thought came that perhaps the escalator ray was no longer running. But the fear was unwarranted. They were caught up, whirled gently downward. Moving along laterally as they descended, they were able to land without difficulty in the middle of the deserted street near the consolidated electric laboratory. Thank heaven, she sighed as their feet touched solid ground. They pressed off both buttons, becoming visible once more. Echo, he agreed. So let's... But Kendrick never completed that sentence, for now whistles all over the metropolitan area rising from the generator plants announced the ominous hour. It was high noon. The ultimatum had expired. Lifting tense faces to the disk, they waited. Would that stupendous ray be hurled back upon itself? or would it sear through their makeshift defense, plunging them and the whole great metropolis into oblivion? Suddenly, catechismically, the answer came. There burst a withering whirlwind from the disk. It struck that mighty concave cathode of interlaced waves above the city. There followed an instant clash of titanic forces. Then the cathode triumphed, hurled it back. Rocked by a concussion as of two worlds in impact, blinded by a glare that made the sunlight seem feeble in comparison, Marjorie and Kendrick clung together while the disk grew into a satellite of calcium fire in the sky. Presently, as the conflagration waned, they opened their eyes. Gravely, but with deep thanksgiving, they searched each other's faces. In them they read deep understanding, too, and a new hope. I think we'd better go and find father, she said at length, quietly. I think so, too, he agreed. As they headed toward the laboratory, a fine powdery dust, like volcanic ash, was falling. It continued to fall until the city streets were covered to a depth of an inch or more. Thus passed the menace of Vada. End of The Flying City Part 2 Read by Marty in Winston-Salem, North Carolina